Tonight's Bible reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 5. One Corinthians chapter five. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that does not occur even among pagans. A man has his father's wife, and you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have been filled with grief and have put out of your own fellowship the man who did this? Even though I am not physically present, I am with you in spirit, and I have already passed judgment on the one who did this, just as if I were present. When you assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus, and I am with you in spirit, and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan, so that the sinful nature may be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast that you may be a new batch without yeast, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. I have written you in my letter not to associate with sex sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral, or greedy, or swindlers, or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. But now I am writing to writing you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or slanderer, a drunkard or a swindler. With such a man, do not even eat. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked man from among you. This is God's word. There are some very strong words in there, and uh, it just happens to be my lot to have to deal with two rather difficult passages on one Sunday. Um, I'm running out of space. Why don't you join with me as we pray? Our Father, we humble ourselves before you this evening, recognizing that you are in this building. We want to acknowledge your presence. We want to acknowledge your lordship. We want to acknowledge your sovereignty. We want to bring ourselves under you and ask that we would not prevent ourselves from hearing what you have to say to us this evening. This is your word. We are your people. And you have something to say to us tonight. And so we pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would take your word and help it to penetrate deep within our hearts, deep within our minds. We pray that you would help us to unstop our ears, not to allow any kind of distraction to deter us from hearing your voice to us, for you are speaking God, and you have spoken decisively in your word, and your word, because it is living, continues to speak to us. So we pray that as we bring ourselves in submission to you this evening, that you would not only enable us to hear from you, but that in some way you would change us, for Jesus' sake. Amen. On a dangerous sea coast where shipwrecks occur, there was once a crude little life-saving station. There was a building that was just a hut, and there was only one boat, but a few devoted members kept a constant watch over the sea and with no thought for themselves went out day and night tirelessly searching for the lost. Some of those who were saved and various others in the surrounding area 
wanted to become associated with the station and give of their time and money and effort for the support of its work. Naturally, if you've been saved, you can understand why you'd want to do that. New boats were bought and new crews were trained. The Life Saving Station grew. Some members of the Life Saving Station were unhappy that the building was so crude and poorly equipped. They felt that a more comfortable place should be provided as the first refuge of those saved from the sea. They replaced the emergency cots with beds and put better furniture in the enlarged building. Now the Life Saving Station became a popular gathering place for its members and they decorated it beautifully and furnished it ex uh, exquisitely because they used it as a sort of a club. Fewer members were now interested in going to the sea on life-saving missions, so they hired a lifeboat crew to do the work. The life-saving motive still prevailed in this club's decorations, and there was a miniature lifeboat in the room where the club initiations were held. About this time, a large ship was wrecked off the coast, and the hired crews brought boatloads in of cold, wet, and half-drowned people. They were dirty and sick. The beautiful new club was in chaos. So the property committee immediately had a shower house built outside the club where the victims of the shipwreck could be cleaned up before coming inside. This is a true story, so I'm not making this up. At the next meeting, there was a split in the club membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the life, uh, club's life-saving activities since they were unpleasant and a hindrance to the normal social life of the club. Some members insisted upon life-saving as their primary purpose and pointed out they were still called a life-saving station. But they were finally voted down and told if they wanted to save the lives of all the various kinds of people who were shipwrecked in those waters, they could be begin their own life-saving station down the coast. And so they did. Uh, as the years went by, the new station experienced the same changes as the old one. It evolved into a club, and yet another life-saving station was founded. History continued to repeat itself, and if you visit that seacoast today, you will find a number of exclusive clubs along the shore. Shipwrecks are frequent in those waters, but most of the people drown. The history of some churches resembles that life-saving station. We start out well. We form as reaching out to our community. We gather together a group of believers who believe the same things, who are committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we begin to modify and get nicer buildings and grow and improve our facilities and we get caught up in the business side of church. And we get caught up in disputes. Should we have green seats or blue seats? Should we buy cameras or not? And we allow those things to begin to distract us. And then we, we set up a, a church so that it, it becomes kind of geared towards making us as comfortable as possible. And so we become comfortable in our situation. As long as we aren't moved out of our comfort zone, we're happy and it's nice and it becomes something like that life-saving club, a social club. We come to church not because we necessarily want to hear from the Word of God. Though I'm not saying this is true of all of you. Please don't misunderstand me. But sometimes we come because our friends come. And it's a time to catch up with each other, to socialize, and it's not to say that socializing is not important. It's not to say that friendships are not important. No, nope, not at all. But that can sometimes distract us from the real reason why we gather together. The real re reason why we come to worship and glorify and magnify God. And sometimes we allow ourselves to go down paths that are not necessarily biblical, 
but seem good at the time, and seem attractive. And, and maybe if we make ourselves more and more attractive to the outsiders, uh, the outsiders will come in. And then we begin to modify the message. Because you don't want to say anything that's going to chase people away. And so you remove certain theological fundamentals from your message. We don't talk about hell, judgment, or those kinds of things. And the church becomes a group of people who gather together more because of the social events that they can enjoy and the friendships they have than they are as a holy community devoted to God. And then we begin to tolerate sin. And we are comfortable with not necessarily having to deal with sin because, you know, it's in the hard basket. It is. It's just it, when we know of people who are acting in ways contrary to their faith, it's just better to leave a sleeping dog. Don't touch it because in case it rears up and bites you or gets angry and then leaves the church. And so we just leave it by. And so God's church becomes more and more polluted and Paul addresses this problem. And you know, when, when we sit here tonight and we are 2,000 years down the line, it's easy for us to, at an arm's length, say, you know, that's the Corinthian church, it's not us today. But can I ask you a question for those of you who have been coming to this church or other churches before you came here? When last can you remember that you ever had a church meeting where a church discipline issue was dealt with in that meeting? Can you remember? Has it ever occurred? How long ago did it occur? 10 years? 20 years? 30 years? And it's because partly when we deal with those issues, and Will and Nathan know this because I've chatted to them about this, when you, you deal with people who are straying from God's ways and are, are living in an immoral way and are acting in ways that are inconsistent with your faith, and you go and you approach them and, and you try and deal with the issue, you know how it's going to go very quickly. And in my experience, what's happened in churches where... As the pastor, I've had to do this. Many have just walked out and left. We just go somewhere else. Because they don't want to have to confront those issues. And it's much easier just to leave. And so you don't have to deal with those issues than it is to face the discipline that might come. I've had some others, having said that, who have submitted to the discipline process. And we haven't necessarily brought it to a church meeting because we haven't had to get to that point where we've had to bring it to a church meeting. They have responded, and praise God for that. But what is apparent in this particular passage, and you just can't avoid it, can you, is that Paul comes to this Corinthian church and says, listen, you guys cannot continue to allow immoral practices to occur in your church and turn a blind eye to them and pretend it's okay and say that the life of church can continue and Jesus Christ is not concerned with this and expect God to bless you. It's just not going to happen. You have to deal with these issues because God's community that gathers together is a holy community. And it is a community that must reflect the holiness of God. Peter, when he writes in 1 Peter 1.16, says, Be you holy as I am holy. And God expects his church to ensure that she is living in a way that reflects his holiness, that reflects his purity. And therefore, where that purity is brought into compromise by its individual members, it is necessary for the church to purge itself of those impurities. And so the Apostle Paul, at least four times in this passage, and it's strong words that he uses, it's not brought out in the NIV except in the very last verse, he literally says, expel the immoral Christian. Don't tolerate the immorality in your, in, your, in your church. Don't allow the community of the church to be affected by them. Get rid of them. Send them out. Expel them. 
Let them taste what it's like to be excluded from the covenant community. Let them be exposed to the wiles of the devil out there. And then maybe and perhaps as a result of the exposure out there and the removal of the protection that there is within the covenant community, they may come to their senses and they may turn and repent and then you can restore them back into fellowship. This is radical stuff. Where else does this happen? You can belong to a netball club and you can have people committing immorality in that club and no one bats an eyelid, do they? But it's different in the church because this is God's people and we belong to God and we have a responsibility to live in a way that reflects who God is. We don't have the freedom to pick and choose which parts of Scripture we like and which parts of Scripture we don't like. We are under the authority of God. We bring ourselves under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And when we do that, we must reflect the values of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul, as he addresses the sensitive issue within the church, a church, mind you, that is boasting about its immorality, he rebukes them, and he does it on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we are to function the way that God has created us to function, then can I say as lovingly as I know how, we cannot and must not tolerate immorality in our ranks. This is a non-negotiable. And while it's easy to say, you know, that's the job of the pastors, let Ian and Nathan and Will, they can deal with those messy, difficult issues. The truth is, some of what Nathan, Will, and I know is not what you know. And so sometimes the immorality that is occurring, you may be aware of in someone else's life that we are completely unaware of. And so the responsibility doesn't just fall upon the shoulders of the pastors or the elders or the deacons to deal with it. It falls upon every person who is in God's community. We are not independent that we can operate as though we are not connected to each other. We are bound by the unity that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a result of that connection and Jesus being the head of the church, we are responsible as God's people to ensure that we are loving each other in a way that causes us to address those difficult issues when they rear their ugly heads. And so we should care enough and love enough to deal with those we are aware of who are living in persistent immorality. So firstly, I want you to notice the problem of immorality, verses 1 and 2. Eight. This is, I mean, you almost, you read this and you think this can't be. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that does not even occur among the pagans. A man as his father's wife. Now, this is in a Greco-Roman society. Now, while the Romans have dominated and invaded and have conquered Greece, they say that in spite of the fact that the Romans had won, it was the Greek culture that conquered the Romans. And in this Greco-Roman world, it was common practice that when you were Gentile and you came to Christ, that the kind of immoral practices you were engaged in before you came to Christ just continued. And, and, and there was no real problem with the fact that you could continue to do these things. So, for example, if I can quote a contemporary author of the time, Demosthenes has written, We keep prostitutes for pleasure. We keep mistresses for the day-to-day -day needs of the body. We keep wives for the begetting of children and for the faithful guardianship of our homes. So long as a man supported his wife and family, there was no shame whatsoever in extramarital affairs. And so the church of God is being plagued 
by this looseness with regard to morals and this lack of transformation that is meant to have occurred at the point of conversion. And these Gentile Christians are coming into the church saying, we don't have to give up our immorality. And there is, even today, a form of Christianity that kind of says, we, we, we embrace Christ, we, we, we will become part of the fellowship, but, but that doesn't mean we necessarily have to stop doing some of the things that we know Scripture says we shouldn't do. Because there's freedom in Christ, you see, and they were boasting about their liberty in Christ. Christ has set us free. We're free to do whatever we want. We are no longer under the law. They'd become antinomian. In other words, they were anti the law. And as far as they were concerned, Jesus Christ bringing in the new covenant had completely dismissed the law. The law was no longer applicable to them. And since grace brought freedom, and since if you just sin more, Paul deals with this in Romans, you just had more grace. And so they, they, they would reason uh, along the lines of saying, well, if God's grace is inexhaustive, if there, there's just grace upon grace upon grace, then the more we sin, the more we receive grace. So let's keep sinning more and more. It's a terrible logic, isn't it? But that's how they function. And Paul cuts across this and says, you know, there's a form of immorality that is going on amongst you that not even the pagans would tolerate. And the problem that he's dealing with is that there is a son sleeping with his father's wife. Now, the, the Greek brings out that this is probably a stepmother. We're not told whether his father is alive or whether they're divorced or, or uh, uh, what the situation is. All we are told is the son is sleeping with his mother, his stepmother. Now, Leviticus deals with this. Let me read some verses from it. Lest we think that this is something God tolerates. Leviticus 18.8, do not have sexual relations with your father's wife. That would dishonor your father. Leviticus 20.11, if a man sleeps with his father's wife, he has dishonored his father. Both, listen, both the man and the woman must be put to death. Their blood will be on their own heads. Now, when Paul uses the word in the original language, expel, get rid of, uh, uh, this particular person, it has such force that it can and can be used, it may be used, of putting someone to death. Now, Paul is not saying that. But, but the point that is being made is he is very strongly opposed to this, for God is strongly opposed to this. And so he uses very strong language to communicate what's going on. Now, the word that he uses for immorality there, or sexual immorality, is the word that you all know well. It's the word in the Greek, porneia. It's where we get our English word, pornography. And it means, broadly speaking, any kind of sexual immorality. This is a specific nature of the sexual immorality that is happening in this particular church, but it is not confined to that particular area of sexual immorality. Rather, what the Apostle Paul is saying is you cannot tolerate any form whatsoever of any kind of sexual immorality that is being practiced in this church. Now, it's even worse because the attitude taken towards this man is one of boasting. I mean, can you believe that? Here is a church boasting about this man who is sleeping with his mother. They're proud about it. And Paul says not even the secular society would tolerate that kind of rubbish. What was happening in this church is they were just justifying sin. They were excusing sin. They were tolerating sin. They were watering it down and saying, it's not that serious, you know. They're just having a bit of fun together. Now, when we try and bring that into our own context, we are living in a highly sexualized age, are we not? I don't have to tell you that. And Pastor Nathan, I thought, did a really good job this evening, bringing out one aspect of that. And he's right. 
And I think most men would agree when you walk down into a shopping center, you have to avert your eyes frequently. But in a sense, it's such a sensitive subject. I was at a church, I won't say which one, where there was a particular young lady who came dressed completely inappropriately to church. And one of the ladies in the church approached her and spoke to her about her inappropriate dress. And she got so angry that she came to me and she said, I want to meet with you because someone's told me I shouldn't dress like this. And I had a meeting with her later that week and tried to explain to her that the feedback she was given was biblical. <laughs> she wasn't happy about it. We live in a society where access to pornography is everywhere and anywhere. You can get on your computer and you can type in certain words and it will take you to sexually explicit sites. And when we read the stats that are coming out, not just of secular society, but when Barna, the Barna Group does these stats, and I know it's done in America, but it's no different there as it is to here, about the amount of Christians who are accessing pornography, it's staggering. Because you can do that in the privacy of your own home. You can do it behind closed doors. You can do it when no one else is around. And you can justify it, can't you? You can use arguments like, well, you know, I'm not married yet, and, and this is a way for me to gain sexual release. Or I'm in a bad marriage where we, we don't have any sex, and, and, and my wife is just preventing me, or my husband is not engaging in, our, in the sexual part of our marriage, and so I feel justified in looking at pornography. And we indulge in those things as though it were okay. God will forgive me. God's going to turn a blind eye. You know, at the end of the session, when I'm feeling really bad and guilty about it, and, and, and I know I shouldn't have done it, I'll just get on my knees and I'll, I'll say, sorry, Lord. And then a few weeks later, I'm back on the computer, or a few days or a few hours. We know different. We live in a world where premarital sex is all over. Do you know when you, you read this, I mean, it's horrific. I, I just, sometimes I can't process it. Sometimes I think I'm naive and, and I'm in a Christian community and I just don't realize what's going on out there. But when they talk about people in the secular world getting married today, and they talk about the amount of sexual relationship they've had, amount of sex they've had, and how many people they've had sex with, you know, for the average man, it's about 25, and the woman, it's about 18, 19. And you know, within the church, how sad it is that those sometimes who get engaged feel that now that they're engaged and they've committed to each other, they can engage in a sexual relationship, and they don't wait until they make their vows before God and before God's community. And we buy into the world's philosophy. I mean, we buy into this philosophy that says, well, it's not going to hurt us. There's, there's no damage that's going to be done. Let me tell you, young men and young women, if you are watching pornography, you will not get those images out your mind when you get married. They will be imprinted upon your mind forever. And we are told by psychologists, no less, that those who engage in watching pornography, soon enough, within their marriage relationship, the sex becomes more difficult. And it's harder for them to engage and be aroused in that relationship because the pornography has affected their senses, affected their brain, rewired their brain. And I know I've heard this because I've, I've counseled people like this who say to me, uh, but, but, you know, once I get married, I'll stop the pornography. You won't. You won't. People think that marriage is the panacea that cures all ills and suddenly cures the sexual urges and suddenly I'm not going to look at those things anymore because now I'm married. 
I sat with a young couple who hadn't been married for more than a couple of months. But the young girl was in tears, saying, my husband's looking at pornography. And when I had dealt with them prior, and we had raised, I raised the subject, he had said, I will stop. But he didn't. Can I tell you, and can I say to you, if you are one of those sitting here who's engaging in pornography, stop it now. Cut it out. And ask that God, by His grace, will strengthen you. For God has said in Ephesians 3, 16, that He dwells in us and strengthens us by might, by power, creatorial power, the same power that God brought into this world, into creation, that same power is given to you by the Holy Spirit. You are not left on your own to fight these things. You are given a supernatural power to enable you to resist temptation when it comes. Draw on that lest you fall into the same category of this church. Look at the effects of this immorality. Verses 6 to 8. The effects of this immorality. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast. There's that word, get rid. Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new batch without yeast. And you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. Here, he refers back to the Passover. He refers back to the Old Testament and where they would keep yeast over for a week for the next bread, uh, next time they made bread, and it would kind of sour and make a sourdough. And, and Jesus is using that as an illustration, or Paul is using that as an illustration and saying, don't allow this old yeast uh, of the past to infect the whole batch because when you add the yeast to the dough, it affects all of the dough. And so you cannot commit sexual immorality in a covenant community without the entire covenant community in some way, even if it's not an overt way, suffering as a result, do you see? It's the same as putting new wine into old wineskins. When you put the new wine into the old wineskins, the, the wineskins burst. It just doesn't work. And so Paul is saying, don't allow this, what is going to contaminate the entire church, don't allow it to spread throughout the, old, uh, the, the whole church. Don't let the whole body be affected. Now you may say to me, how is the body affected? It's affected because Jesus withdraws his blessing. For Jesus is concerned for his church. It only takes one bad egg to make all the rest rotten. Now I want to illustrate this, and I brought something to try and illustrate this. Because I want something graphic for you to go home and remember. And if I make a mess, then try not to laugh. That's the church. Pure, holy, in God's sight uncontaminated, and this is what happens when we sin. Yes, I still have a fountain pen. And you know what I've done? I forgot to put the ink in. Watch what happens. And then when we mix it around a bit, see how the water's changed? That's one drop. One drop of ink. There's no place in that water that hasn't been affected by the ink. Would you drink that now? Not if you want to get sick. You don't want to get sick. 
That's what happens in the church. When we have one person who's involved in some kind of immoral practice, the whole church is affected. David Brainard, in one of his diaries, wrote the following. I never got away from Jesus and him crucified. I found that when my people were gripped by this great evangelical doctrine of Christ and him crucified, I had no need to give them instructions about morality. I found that one followed as sure as the inevitable fruit of the other. I find my Indians begin to put on the garments of holiness. Their common life begins to be sanctified, even in small matters where they're possessed by the doctrine of Christ and Him crucified. That's why Paul mentions the fact that Jesus Christ has been sacrificed. Because what ought to motivate us, what ought to transform us, what ought to help us to realize that we are not that which uh, co should contaminate the whole, is that Jesus Christ has cleansed you. Jesus Christ has brought new life in you. Jesus Christ has taken away your sin. Jesus Christ has sanctified you. Jesus Christ has made you holy. Jesus Christ sacrificed his life. He died so painfully and cruelly on that cross so that you might be made holy. And now that you are that, now that God dwells in you through the power of the Holy Spirit, now that Jesus Christ is your Lord and you have submitted yourself to his lordship, now that you have put the old person to death or Jesus has put the old man to death, the old woman to death, that person is dead. They're gone. They're finished. They're done for through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. You participate in his death insofar as that the person who used to live and had desires of the old nature, who loved the things of the world, has now been crucified with Christ. They're gone. Now you are a new creation in Christ. Now you have been sanctified in Jesus Christ. Now you have been cleansed. Now you have been made pure. Now you are holy in God's sight. So in effect, Paul is saying, be what you are. That's what you are. Stop going back to the mud. That's not where you belong. That's not consistent with who you are. You are in Christ now. Go back to the cross. Remember what Christ has rescued you from. Remember what he has delivered you to. Remember what he has made you. You are new in him. Don't forget it. It's in a sense in which what, uh, what Paul is saying is don't suffer from osmosis. Don't suffer from memory loss. Don't forget the cost at which your life was bought. It is through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Don't trample underfoot his blood. Don't consider his blood as something that is insignificant. Don't minimize his sacrifice on the cross. Don't cheapen his grace. Don't cheapen his death. He bought you with his life. Now be what you are. You transformed. You knew. You're in Christ. Now live according to what you've been made into. Do you see? Whenever we sin against God, whenever we allow ourselves to be drawn into temptation, we forget who we are. It's like the man, as James says, who looks into the mirror and then immediately forgets who he is. You cannot look into the face of the Lord Jesus Christ and dwell upon his sacrifice and think through what has happened to you and how you've been transformed and not live a life that reflects that transformation. You see, those who have come to Christ and those who have had the power of the Holy Spirit change them cannot but live according to the changes that God has effected in them through Christ by the Holy Spirit. 
There's a sense in which our Christianity comes to the surface. It bubbles over. It comes out. It's like that old tale of the little girl who who talks about uh, Jesus sticking out all through her. And Christ becomes evident. Do you see? Christian cannot claim transformation and love their sin. It's impossible. You don't live there. You don't live in your sin. You can't dwell there because that's not who you are. And it's impossible for you to continue to love sin and to love it perpetually and at the same time in the next breath say I'm a Christian. That doesn't mean you won't sin. It doesn't mean that you're not going to fall prey to temptation. It doesn't mean that you're not going to end up doing things that you know you ought not to do. What it does mean is that you cannot dwell there. You cannot stand there forever. You do not relish it. But you come away with it, mourning, grieved over your sin. And thus Paul says to them, you should be mourning over your situation. You should look at yourselves and recognize how you have sinned against God, against the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And that should cause in you such a deep sense of pain and suffering and mourning that it should drive you to repentance. Because that is the experience of the Christian. We hate sin because Jesus hates sin. And we hate it when we sin. And even though there may have been a moment of pleasure in the moment at which we did sin, as we look back upon that sin we committed, we look back on it with great tears in our eyes and we mourn the fact that we even loved that sin. We mourn because that's not who we are. And that's not what Christ has made us into. Transformation is total. It's complete. Let me try and illustrate this. The Scottish preacher John McNeil used to tell a story about an eagle that had been captured when it was quite young. The farmer who snared the bird put a restraint on it so it couldn't fly. And then he turned it loose to roam in the barnyard. It wasn't long till the eagle began to act like the chickens, scratching and pecking the ground. This bird that had once soared high in the heavens seemed to be satisfied to live the barnyard life of the lowly hen. One day the farmer was visited by a shepherd who came down from the mountains where the eagle lived. Seeing the eagle, the shepherd said to the farmer, what a shame it is to keep that bird hobbled up in your barnyard. Why don't you let it go? The farmer agreed. So they cut off the restraint. But the eagle continued to wander around, scratching and pecking as before. The shepherd picked it up and set it on a high stone wall. For the first time in months, the eagle saw the grand expanse of the blue sky and the glowing sun. Then it spread its wings with a leap, soared off into the tremendous spiral flight, up and up and up. Finally, it was acting like an eagle. You're an eagle. Now act like one. Soar with Christ. Fly with Him. Allow his life to flow in and through you. You have his life in you. Let that life drive you. Let it drive your thoughts. Let it drive your words. Let it drive your behavior. Let it drive your attitudes. Let it determine your priorities. Let it ooze out of every pore of your body. Don't go back to the muck. You don't belong there. And then thirdly, very quickly, look at the removal of immorality. Look what he says. Verses 2b to 5. 
put out your fellowship, the man who did this. Even as though I'm not with you physically present, I'm with you in spirit. And I've already passed judgment on the one who did this when you are assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus and I'm with you in spirit and the power of the Lord Jesus is present. Hand this man over to Satan so that the sinful nature may be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. Verses 9 to 13. I've written to you, it should be two, I've written to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral, greedy, and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. But now I'm writing writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but a sexually immoral, greedy, or an idolater, a slanderer, a drunkard, a swindler, with such a man do not even eat. Now, what is Paul saying? Paul is saying, listen, if you've got people like that in the church, don't associate with them. Don't invite them around to your home for a meal. Don't have fellowship with them. Don't allow them to enjoy the fellowship of the church. Expel them. Take them out of the church. Throw them back into the secular world. Let them experience what it's like to be out there amongst unbelievers, ungodly people. Don't allow them to come and enjoy any of the fellowship events you might, you might have as a church. Don't allow them to come to your services. Don't allow them to partake in communion if they won't leave. But Put them out there in the world and in the hope that as they are exposed to Satan, and there may be some physical effects here, it's not entirely certain, but as they are exposed to Satan, then maybe as a result of being exposed to the world, they will come to their senses and they will realize what they are missing out on. And they will repent. The goal is restoration. The goal is for them to come back into the fellowship of the church. The goal is for them to see the error of their ways. The goal of them is to come confront their sin and to deal with their sin and to repent from their sin, but don't allow them back until they've done that. Gee, that's radical, isn't it? That is, it's radical. Expel. The immoral brother, he says. Now, Paul says this doesn't concern unbelievers. So don't do the same thing for unbelievers. That's a different ball game. It's not our right to judge them. God does that. But we are called for those in the church that we exercise discernment and judgment. And we don't leave it lie. Now, the hope of all of this is that as a result of not only being excluded from the church, God's blessing will one day once again rest upon the church. But by sending this person out into the world, that they will repent and come back to Christ. Because, says the Apostle Paul, it's much more important that they be saved then they experience physical connectedness or well-being amongst God's people. So let me ask you, are you willing to do the hard yards? Do you know someone who's in a compromising situation, whether it be sexually or financially, On some other realm, are you just turning a blind eye to their sin and condoning it and saying, it's okay? Are you unwilling to take that to the next level by confronting them and saying, listen, we need to sit down and have a chat. You can't continue doing that. And if you do, I'm going to report it to the church. I'm going to go to one of the pastors and I'm going to tell them. Or are we going to just push that at an arm's length and say, no, 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 that's too difficult. You and I have a responsibility and an accountability towards God, our maker, to ensure that as far as we know and as far as is possible and as far as what we might have knowledge of, not that we have knowledge of everything that's going on, but where there is serious immorality within God's people, that it is brought to the surface exposed, and dealt with decisively. 
Yeah, it's a difficult passage, I know. It's hard for me to preach this. I don't preach it with any glee or any sense of satisfaction, but it's God's word. And you and I are called to obey God, to submit ourselves to him, to follow him, and to act in ways that are consistent with our faith. Otherwise, it's an empty faith. So my dear friends, let's take up the challenge. And let's love and care for one another enough not to allow each other to stray from God's paths as revealed in God's word. Amen. Our Father, there are times when we go through your word and there are some very strong, strong things you say to us. But Jesus gave his life for the church. He suffered for the church. He bore the penalty for its sin. The anguish of his cry on the cross reflects something of the depths of the pain that he endured so that we might be brought into a relationship with you through him. And since you make us holy, and since you have called us to be holy, and since we bring our lives under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Help us not only to live out our Christianity in a consistent manner, but help us to deal with those in our midst who perhaps for some reason, whatever it might be, have strayed from your paths and are committing persistent immorality. Give us the courage to deal with it for the honor and glory of your great name. Amen. We're going to close by singing a song written, I think it was by Keith Green, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Maybe this might need to be some of the prayer of some of you tonight. <laughs>